20 seconds. All right, let's start. Um, make sure you're getting clickers for next week, please. Okay. Um, you, don't need, you don't need them today. Yeah. Yeah, but, but yeah, get them and then we'll make sure they're working and you can use them. Okay. Um, they're important, they're a big component of your grade, so make sure they're charged and things like that. Okay. They have batteries in them. I had mine since freshman year, and I had no idea. You pass your classes. <laughs> All right. Um, so today we're going to be talking about taphonomy. Okay. Anyone know what taphonomy is? Good guess. Yes. Not quite fossils. It's looking at the process of how things fossilize and biases that occur in that process. So learning objectives for today. So understand what causes biases in the fossil record, what about different kinds of body fossils, and then create hypotheses about other biases that might occur. Okay. Why do we care about biases? They're different from the truth. They're different from the truth. Right. <coughs> um, is that a problem for science? Yes. Yes, right. Right, trying to go after the truth, right? So you have something that makes it hard to detect the truth, that's a problem, right? Um, <coughs> and so you want to figure out what these are so we can correct for them, okay? Now, at the very end of the class, actually today, some of the sort of biases actually do tell us something else about the process causing the bias, right? So this is sort of interesting in itself, right? So let's see what, what, what happens there. Um, but in general, I just want to understand this first. Any questions about this? Any questions about the stuff we've covered previously? Okay. So, let's go to ecology. What? Yes. <coughs> so, ecological pyramid. What is, this, what is this showing? Yep, we're going to have biomass for each trophic level. Let's raise hands through make sure yeah, perfect. We're going to have biomass for each trophic level. So we have a lot of producers on land, a lot of consumers in the ocean, right? Prey from the ocean. Why is that? Yeah. Turnover rates on the big turnover factors that produce in the ocean, so it enables a, a higher sustaining population that reduces the ocean that produces weeds and so fast and so forth for those mm -hmm. states. Now you have this phytoplankton that's always being you know, turned over and stuff like that, whereas land, and you have a tree. So it's there 50 years, 200 years, you know, loses lose some leaves, whatever, right? But it's a long time for turnover for that, okay? <coughs> and so when we see, you know, take a snapshot of land, we'll see lots of grass, you know, some cows, and some predators, like, you know, wolves. Whereas the ocean, take a snapshot, see lots of blue water, you can only see the phytoplankton that's there, then see, you know, lots of fish, but not so much anymore, right? So here, we have La Brea Tar Pits. Right, so you go to downtown LA, there's an Austin museum there, right, that has, you know, tar bubbling in front, okay? And you go inside, and they have, you know, entire walls of wolf skulls and things like that. And, you know, 90% of the fossils they found there are carnivores. Okay. Wolves, um, eagles, vultures, condors. Um, <coughs> and also some, you know, some herbivores like ground sloths. Okay. Does that mean they had inverted, inverted, inverted trophic pyramid there? Right. It was more like an aquatic environment? No. Well, what, what explains this? Mm -hmm. So, first thing you know, grass would not preserve as well as, you know, nice hard wolf bones. It's good. What else? Yeah? Herbivores get stuck in the, whatever it is, the, the tar, and then the other herbivores go away. They 
so they die, but then on the horse's knee, it doesn't get all that. Yeah, so it's a trap. And so, you know, um, this looks like, you know, oh, I'm thirsty. Look, you know, this looks wonderful. I'll go in there, ah, you know, get stuck. And so if you're a ground sloth, you can't get out, right? Like, ah, 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 whatever they sound like. And then wolves will come in and try to eat them. They get stuck. They're made of meat, too. You know, vultures will come, oh, look at this great feast, come in, die, and so forth. <coughs> and so you get this attraction to this, you know, killing place. Actually, an article in the New York Times two days ago about the same thing happening in Africa now, where poachers will kill an elephant and c kill in somehow put pesticides on it, and then vultures will come and die, that's like eating pesticides, and more will come and die. It's like 1,700 vultures at once killed from this one poisoned elephant. Right, the same thing can happen today. Because if you're, it takes like a half hour to hack through the, the ivory to get it. Because if you have vultures circling down, rangers say, oh, what's going on over there? Let's go check it out. If the vultures near you're all dead, Not ED graduates. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so here we see this bias caused by how things are being caught and preserved. Right? And if you didn't take that into account, you'd say, oh, there's some weird trophic structure here. But let's say this in the like, oh, maybe it's a regular trophic structure. Okay? Now, thinking of if it's the regular one or different, we need to know the extent of that bias. Right? Are wolves 2% you know, more likely to end up there or 200% more likely? So that's sort of an example of how talking about bias matters in the real world. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, here we see some kind of dinosaur in the National Monument. Okay. And here is a huge assemblage of dinosaur bones. Okay, and often large ones clumped together. Okay. Why would there be large bones clumped together? Because, you know, when we die, right, have some large bones, have some really tiny bones in my ear, right? Some of them come in and take my small bones away, or what? Yeah. Maybe they were eaten, so they could have washed away, maybe? Mm -hmm. Right, so they could have been, some, some sort of thing happens after death, before fossilization, could lead to biases like that. So in this case, it's not thought that it, they were washed away in a flood. But it could be, we'll talk about later in the class, you know, car, uh, um, Scavengers preferentially getting certain kinds of bones. Okay, good. So in that case, where ta knowing taphonomy matters. Okay. And also, this is, this is, you know, um, you know, flood in a river that causes the bones to be all jumbled. You might not look for, you know, did offspring, you know, assemble, let's say, next to their parents or something like that, because it's all been mixed up. So you might not expect to see that. Okay. <coughs> okay let's talk a little bit about fossilization. Sexual video. It isn't easy to become a fossil. The fate of nearly all living organisms, over 99.9% .9 of them, is to compost down to nothingness. When your spark is gone, every molecule you own will be nibbled off you or sluiced away to be put to use in some other system. That's just the way it is. Even if you make it into the small pool of organisms, the less than 0.1% that don't get devoured, the chances of being fossilized are very small. In order to become a fossil, several things must happen. First, you must die in the right place. Only about 15% of rocks can preserve fossils, so it's no good keeling over on a future site of granite. In practical terms, the deceased must become buried in sediment, where it can leave an impression, like a leaf in wet mud, or decompose without exposure to oxygen, permitting the molecules in its bones and hard parts, and very occasionally softer parts, to be replaced by dissolved minerals, creating a petrified copy of the original. Then, as the sediments in which the fossil lies are carelessly pressed and folded and pushed about by Earth's processes, the fossil must somehow maintain an identifiable shape. Finally, but above all, after tens of millions, or perhaps hundreds of millions of years hidden away, it must be found and recognized as something worth keeping. Only about one bone in a billion, it is thought, ever becomes fossilized. If that is so, 
it means that the complete fossil legacy of all the Americans alive today, that's 270 million people with 206 bones each, will only be about 50 bones, one quarter of a complete skeleton. Well, that's not to say, of course, that any of these bones will actually be found, bearing in mind that they can be buried anywhere within an area of slightly over 3.6 million square miles, little of which will ever be turned over, much less examined, it would be something of a miracle if they were. Fossils are, in every sense, vanishingly rare. Most of what has lived on Earth has left behind no record at all. It has been estimated that less than one species in 10,000 has made it into the fossil record. That in itself is a stunningly infinitesimal proportion. However, if you accept the common estimate that the Earth has produced 30 billion species of creature in its time, and Richard Leakey and Roger Lewin's statement in The Sixth Extinction that there are 250,000 species of creature in the fossil record, that reduces the proportion to just one in 120,000. Either way, what we possess is the merest sampling of all the life that Earth has spawned. Moreover, the record we do have is hopelessly skewed. Most land animals, of course, don't die in sediments. They drop in the open and are eaten, or left to rot, or weathered down to nothing. The fossil record, consequently, is almost absurdly biased in favor of marine creatures. About 95% of all the fossils we possess are of animals that once lived underwater, mostly in shallow seas. Any questions about that? So here you can see, you know, some of the process of population. So you can die, die, right? And then it has to be buried by sediment, okay? Um, so if you're a dinosaur living in you know, an arid area, it doesn't happen. If you're a dinosaur living in a rainforest, it doesn't happen. It has to be living you know, near a river that floods, or something like that. So you're very lucky. Um, then buried, then petrified, right? Not scared to death, but that's already happened. But turned to rock. Then, I mean, through time, rocks change, right? So if you drive a highway, you see a highway cut, right? Rocks are, rocks are put down horizontally. But the highway cuts, you'll see the rocks are just more like that and that and that. What causes that? Well, the earth moves and shifts, right? The Rockies are still getting higher. Right? Still pushing up there. Everest is getting higher every year. The climate now will get harder tomorrow, right? <coughs> so our earth is always moving around. And so that causes things to be stretched and squished, rocks can go you know, under other plates and melt, right? You can have metamorphic rocks, rocks that sort of cook and become you know, mud and things, you can't find much in it. And then you can both dry sediment and rocks to stay sedimentary. And finally, <coughs> you can see that the rocks are still Find or you know find them, and so people like in the West here, U.S. West, Montana, or South Dakota, will walk along and find little bits of fossil, and then walk up to a cliff where the fossils are eroding out of it. So they get just much eroding, and back ten years later, it won't be there. Okay, so it's a very big chance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's, so there's. Right, so there's ground penetrating radar. Yeah. And so they use that to, they can use that to help find some, some things, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think they found, it was like Henry the Fifth or someone in a parking lot in England where they use, they had records and they use radar like that to find the bones. Like, oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. yeah. The making dinosaurs from fossil DNA, that's still in the development. But we don't talk about that much. Yet. Other questions? Now, forming rock isn't the only way to get fossils. <coughs> you're the child, and you're touching a little mammoth, right? And it's freeze-dried mammoth. Okay, so it comes up to the grass and grows, and now with global warming, hooray, all that ice is melting, and we're finding lots of fire on mammoths. Fresh meat. Yeah, it's actually, I think it's supposed to be edible. Um, a good way, it's a waste to eat it. There's actually some proposals to do that, um, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. The, in general, this is, this is 
de-extinction process, which we can talk about later. Um, but we'll continue to bring these interesting things back. So yeah, so it's cool because that way we can get out, we can get DNA from this, we can find out what it was eating inside, we can find out what food was in its environment, what was in its stomach contents. So mainly we can learn about the about the habitat as well. Okay. What's this? Amber. Amber. Right. Um, <coughs> so amber, you know, the craft we find lots of insects in amber, other arthropods. Um, there's actually an anole found in amber. That's, uh, I mean, what is how is the amber formed? Yes. Yes. All right, so the trees have from a few species of trees, drip down and catch something unlucky. Okay, and preserve it really, really well. Okay, permineralization, right? This is like pickling. Right? So how's the pickle different from a cucumber? We have all this nice, you know, vinegary juice that's, that's permeated its, its tissue. Right? Similar sort of thing here, but with minerals rather than vinegar. Okay. And it can preserve lots of structures. So what's this? Kind of, kind of yeah. Um, so very well preserved. Compression fossils, flattened. Yeah. We have a lot of fossils of this kind too. So here we have organic, organic material that's been modified to become rock. Okay. What's the problem with a compression fossil? Only certain organisms can be fossilized. Yep. It's only for, so it will work well for certain kinds of organisms. Yep. What were you going to say? Oh, so it's not going to deviate from the wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not it's not quite two D, it's pretty effectively two D, right? It's flattened. Um, I think if your questions about like, you know, how eye shape evolves, it's gonna be hard to figure that out from flattened specimens. Okay. Not impossible, because if you have enough of them you can construct it, but harder. Another sort of fossil is a cast or mold fossil. So think of like, you know, in elementary school you made a little cast of a seashell out of plaster, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, the mold is the outside, and the cast is embedding, you know, form through a shell there, that eventually the shell decomposes, and then something else goes in there and solidifies. So you can have the cast inside and the mold outside. <coughs> Those are kinds of body fossils. Okay. <coughs> so here's a, a sort of overview of the pathway where we get, um, how we get fossils. So first, okay, we are here, right, the things that are alive. Okay, what happens next? Death, right? And there's a filter here. So these little screens are filters, right? Go the hand, the hand drawn. Yeah. So we have a various a filter here for stuff that dies. What would be a filter here? What, what sort of causes biases at this stage? Yeah. Say it again. Yep, consumption by other organisms. Yep, by organisms, right. So you could have things you know, eat them right away, and some things that aren't eaten right away is just by a sample, something that's, you know, that's hard to consume or something along reason like that. Yep, good. What else could cause biases here? What's more likely to fossilize? Um, beef cattle or an orangutan? What's more likely to fossilize today? You know, beef cattle or orangutan? Beef, beef cow. Why? It's a lot more of them. Right. So quantity of individuals matters too. It's not just number of species, but also how many members are of any, are of each species. Right. Good. <coughs> right. So now we have. Stuff that's dead, the biases, we can have it, you know, be directly re eaten. Okay? We can have it buried right away, we can have it buried after a while. Okay? Buried after a while, what biases causes to happen there? The scavengers, longer you wait, degradation, right? So by the time you're finally buried and safe, you know, the small bones could have broken down, the skin could have eroded away. Yep, what else? Okay, what about immediate burial? Are there any biases there? 
That's a good idea, right? Right, because you made it so you can faster than you were left when a lot of dinosaurs we have had that pose like that, right? Because they were left outside to dry and their neck tendons compressed. It's to do that. And so maybe they were buried and you would lost, you know, maybe, maybe you know, when they were buried, decomposed because they were the ones that were, you know, dried on the surface. Good. Good. What sort of biases happen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Yep. <laughs> Do you have some deviation from options, but also you have some deviation from things that are aerobic versus anaerobic. And those can proceed different ways, too. Um, also, where in medieval burial happens with bias. Right? So it happens a lot if you're an extra river that floods, right? You drop silt. It doesn't happen as much elsewhere. Here, okay. and put in remains that made genesis where you can drop some fossils. Okay. Um, and then some of those are collected, so there's no bias. Some of those are exposed and reburied. Why is that, why is that an issue? can now be stuck with, you know, fossils in a different time. Right? Which is a rare occurrence, but it could happen. Right? So it's not really good, right? <coughs> and finally, there's this filter. What does it be here? Yeah. Right, find the fossils, right? So there are very few people right now looking for fossils in North Korea. Right? So there's biases that way. Right? There's very few people looking for fossils in Mariana's trench. Is that way. Um, <coughs> what else about the about looking fossils? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a real buy. So a lot of people who are looking at like dinosaur fossils now, the museum has to compete with private collectors and put it in their house. I'm not saying why, but then it's, it's Good, what else? Right. So, um, two early fossil collectors in the U.S. were Cope and Marsh, who were famous. They were like these, you know, sort of cowboys of the West who would go and like dynamite cliffs to get fossils. But now you can see people like with little brushes and stuff, and you know, dynamite, right? And <coughs> they weren't going for like, you know, flower fossils. They're going for like nice dinos, right? And so there's biases there where you miss, you know, the flower fossils because they're not, you know, cool. Museum. And it's not as extreme now, right? We know that, like, I can help under, I can help learn about the dinosaur from looking at the context of where it lived, but there's still those biases, right? We talked about another bias yesterday, last time in the class, I remember. It's in the context of feeding damage. Feeding damage. We talked about that, then that's actually some things where it could, you could have a bias. People only want like the nice dancer, but another one's all chewed up. So that would cause the bias, right? Yeah. There's another one. Mm -hmm. oh, the, the over raptor thing, yep, there's another sort of potential bias and like mis misinterpretation. Good. What else? What about the leaves? Remember the leaves? The, right, the insect damage. Right, so leaves that had the holes in the leaf miner gallery, things like that. And I said that the people who were studying that had to go out and get all the leaves in an area rather than just the pretty leaves in an area. Because right? if you're trying to get fossils for you know, doing plant taxonomy or something like that, you want the ones that are good. You want to carry back you know, 500 pounds of broken up leaves that don't look very nice. You want the ones that have 
the entire leaf margin to count teeth and stuff like that. And so with a bias and only getting the nice fossils rather than just the general set of fossils. Right? And so, you know, we you know we know fossils are precious and things like that, but if you're actually out there in the field getting them, you know, that site has many fossils, you don't have to spend your time getting, you know, a ton of boring, broken up fossils, you want to go to get the most slightly relevant ones. Because that's the bias too. Any questions about this? Okay. <coughs> Here we have sand dollars. Okay. And various filters can you know, break them up. So this one, you know, goes through decay, and goes through some circulation, and so forth, um, and becomes a rock, right? And it's well preserved. This one is the part of So it dies from predation, um, circulates, it gets some more, it fragments. Move around a lot, right? Okay. So this is, you know, the thing what happens to, to it after it dies is the quality of the information. Okay. Um, time averaging. So I find, you know, so we can go out in the Smokies, I take my kids out there, and find a place that has fossils, and get other cameras, and whack away at the rocks, and get you know, pseudo fossils. Um, what time sample, what, what am I sampling? Am I sampling, you know, a bad Thursday 300 million years ago? Or am I sampling, you know, a 10 million year swath? You know? Oh, it's like a, like a, a chunk of stuff all together. Yeah. It's probably that one, but it varies from site to site. Some sites you have a single event, in some sites, it's lots of things dying over a long period of time. So, for example, this one, there are caves in the Caribbean where periodically something wanders around, falls into the cave, and dies. And then, you know, 100 years later, 1,000 years later, something else falls into the cave and dies. And so you go to the cave, we have a stack of bones from thousands of years. They're not quite fossils, but that sort of process. So that's sort of fossilized in the future. You know, they'll all be all mingled up together, but, from, but they, you know, live thousands of years apart from each other. So that'd be a time average. Okay. Whereas a single event, <coughs> who's heard of the Burgess Shale? Okay. What, what's the Burgess Shale? Mm -hmm. Right. And how is it formed? Yeah. Right. Um, so sometimes the fast barrel is like uh, un under underwater slope sort of cause a landslide. And everything that's swimming there, you know, uh, um, sort of caught and buried and flattened and preserved really, really well for a fine sediment. Okay. And that's a single bad event. Pompeii. What's Pompeii? So, Dr. Who, you know this. <laughs> yeah. And so then ash could, you know, cover the town and, you know, kill people very quickly and this, you know, now fossils, you know, pres preserve humans like, you know, holding their kids and stuff. And you have all the old graffiti that was preserved as of that, you know, that day or small time. time. Right? So that's sort of instantaneous period. Okay? And so there's a range of these things. And how, the, why this matters, <coughs> if you have a single event, right, it's less biased towards, um, you know, Abundance and time average, right? Which is sort of snapshot of what I see rather than averaging up time over time over time. But it helps to know what, what kind of preservation you have for this. And we can see for these you know, popular privileges what the time averaging is. Right? So, leaf litter, right? time average over maybe a couple of years. Okay? Drop its blood less. You know, wood, maybe for thousands of years. Very slow. Heat, maybe for thousands of years. Okay? <coughs> Cave versus, you know, um, from river deposition, 
you know, in various ways of you know, speech elements and things like that. So you can see the time averaging is different in different types. Okay. And here we see you know, a kid on a beach, on the beach, and she's looking to stay on corpses of invertebrates, right? Seashells. <coughs> and are these seashells that were killed yesterday? No. Maybe some are, right? But there's the seashells from a long time period. And you know, the waves come in and stuff, they all mix together. Okay. So I'm going to see the effect of climate change on you know, shell thickness. It wouldn't be a bad, bad example to use because it has things that are going to be huge kind of bumps together. <coughs> Any questions about that? Okay. So let's think about how long things are alive, right? So T Rex. Do we have any T Rexes now? No, too bad, right? What? Not living. Not, not living, right. Yeah, there's no living T Rex. How long does T Rex live? How, how would you figure that out? Yeah. Oldest and youngest, right. So my oldest one is found. You know, 66, 60, let's say 68 million years ago, and my newest is 5.6 million years ago. Okay? And so I say, okay, and now I have a couple other fossils in that. Okay. Is that right? Is that how long it lived? That's right, why not? Right. So they could have been living, you know, back here, back here, back here, and up here, up here, up here. Right? We didn't get you know, it wasn't the first time T Rex evolved that suddenly died and fossilized and we caught it. Right? That's why a long line of them that we missed. And after the last one when it, you know, we got fossilized, long one long, long, this, is, uh, this is after that. Right? Mm -hmm. I give you general time, yep. Mm -hmm. Right, so if we know that the sister lineage T Rex and T Rex would have diverged at this point, then there must be this period where it must have existed to see it. It's this lineage. Good. And is this something the paleontologists have thought about? Right, so here's looking at if I have you know, these observations of what something lives, when does it actually live? Right. And there's some very simple math um, to figure out you know, what the life likely range is. If I have, you know, a ton of fossils, and then nothing, right, then assuming there's still areas where, where I should have had fossils, it is the thing that went extinct there. If I have fossil, fossil, right, do I think, okay, yeah, it must have gone on right here? Well, no, there's some uncertainty about when it would have gone extinct. Okay, that's something people think about. Why do we care? So why do we care if T-Rex spanned 1 million years or 20 million years? It has successful, what do you mean successful? Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly, it's really good. So it's just pressure. Good. Why else? Exactly. So we think there's a mass extinction of the Undipertaceous, right? If we find that, you know, I have lots of evidence, so if here's the Undipertaceous, I have, you know, lots of evidence from things that span that. And maybe there wasn't a mass extinction, maybe there was an increased extinction, extinction rate, there wasn't a mass extinction. But I have instead everything stopping just about there, huh? Something bad happened that day. Right. So I this information about that. Good. Um, what else? Right. So what's background extinction? Mm -hmm. Right. 
So right now, you know, we're trying to save every species in the U.S. Well, historically, the species go extinct, right? So maybe you should be like, yeah, you know, like pandas. Like said, uh, pandas are due to go extinct. You know, they're, they're specialists. They, they can't raise their, their offspring well. You know, they have a coming, right? Um, <coughs> and so maybe we shouldn't be worrying about pandas, right? So if we know what background extinction is, we can say, okay, yeah, maybe given what normal processes, we should have, you know, one percent of the species going extinct every thousand years. Now we're having twenty percent, so we can tell how much we it works. Good. Also, we can figure out what was living together at the same time, right? So the big question is like, when it, when did the angiosperms evolve? Right? The angiosperms are cool; they have pollination, they have lots of fruits that are animal dispersed, right? So you say, well, you know, would we expect to have, you know, dinosaurs in the, in the Jurassic period? evolved to disperse fruits from angiosperms. And that's a big debate about whether angiosperms evolved in the Jurassic or later. Um, and that matters to that, to that question. <coughs> Another sort of bias is where you have the right sediments. Right? But, uh, so here in yellow, the sedimentary rock. Okay. Um, red is volcanic, purple is metamorphic, and blue is plutonic. Volcanic well, plutonic are both igneous rock and they're Okay, where are you going to find a fossil? Do like the fossil is here? No. Why? Um, it's not right, not the rock. Right. Now, from here I could, you know, dig down and possibly get some under rock, right? But, you know, digging down the fossil hunt is pretty, pretty tricky. Lots of sediment rock. We, we get lots of fossils in the Okay. okay. <coughs> Alright. Here's another interesting example of something we thought was a mass extinction. Okay. And it actually may have been a mass loss where we find fossils. Alright. So it seems like sea level rise and fall associated with extinction. Would it is actually is that if my land creates sea level, right? If sea level changes, then you know I don't find any terrestrial organisms here anymore. Right? Oh, they've all gone extinct. You know, it's gone above the water. Right? But because of the or or if I look at marine organisms here, now the sea level goes down, oh they've all gone extinct. Well, you just you know, it's not the sea anymore. And so sea level rise and fall, um, and kind of where things can fossilize, can look like mass extinction, but isn't. And so it's thought that a lot of things we thought were extinctions are actually just shifts in where we can, where fossils can fossilize. That's a good example of temporal bias. <coughs> Here's another one. So what's this? I taught Bio 130 and had a talk question about sea otters and kelp. Oh, do you ever put a, question, a picture of, of kelp? Do you know what kelp looks like? It's a sea urchin. Uh, <coughs> so, these eat snails and they eat clams. Okay. And one thing you might, want, might think about is well, how many clams are killed by crabs versus snails are killed by crabs? So, you might look and figure out how many you know, dead snail shells have crab crushes and from how many clams have crab crushes. And this shows the bias. So well, you get us to read this and talk about it. Okay, so what, what's happening here? Let's all explain it here. Yeah. 
And so it causes, you know, snail shells to be broken up a lot more than, so, you know, if 10% of snails are killed by crabs, at some point, you know, the remaining 90% of the portion of them are going to be crushed by crabs too. They're checking out what's inside. Okay? And so that's true of crabs today. How do you care about this, care about this process? Crabs in the past, and who knows? You may travel by too much in the past, too. As the same thing that have happened long ago as well, and caused these bias. Okay. Okay, here we have stretching. So here's you know, the capital of the trial bag. You know, so you know, here's really how it was originally, and then it was scratched as it was, you know, as, as the effort became fossil, as the rock moved around, it stretched a bit, and the shape changed. Okay, so the thing about rock is, you know, Solid rock, the rock over a long time scale is really complexed. Take that into account too. Okay, and here's another example where you're just looking at very modern um, things that you can dollars and fossil minerals and see what happens in terms of temporal pre preservation through time. Okay, you see, so, so see, often we have, you know, predation attempts and recreation attempts um, and so forth in different assemblages. Okay. So it's nice how fossils don't tell us a lot about the habitat too. So here we have a uh, fossil forest. Okay. And so um, for these trees and then the mud grows, okay, so the trees and fossilized And now there's a giant coal mine, right? Um, and in the roof, you have to see you know, fossil tree trunks in this old lycopsid forest. So here is an early evolution of wood, and these trees, the wood grew a different way. It wasn't formed like rings, it was more like wedges. It was a very different way of having tree growth in the modern, most modern trees. So here's what that forest looked like, right? And now we have this giant fossil f assemblage that put on Knoxville. It's the size of it. It's really this assemblage where you can look at all the river channels and trees and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> hold a pretty large area. Okay, so looking at not just the individual fossils, but the, their location, you can find out about you know, how the rivers used to flow, um, whether some trees are specialists for within channels. Here's another example of biases. Okay, I'll just have to read this. Okay, it's kind of a weird story and see if we can talk about it. So what's this doing? What does what this say?
Yeah, this is different from, from an assemblage of just you know dead herbivores in a pit, a cave trap. How is this assemblage different from that? Yep. Carnivores, right? How so? Yep. Selective predation and selective like cracking the bones, right? And so hyenas are cool because well for other reasons too, but they can crush through bone and get the marrow inside. Um, and whereas most most terrestrial carnivores can't do that. Okay. <coughs> and so you can see, you know, from this bias of you know what we found, how it crushed, something about how carnivore, how you know hyenas hunted back then. Okay. And so here's some see the evidence of this you know tough bias of you know finding these crushed bones. And he tells us something here about subsequent behavior. Okay. More than just sort of a random sample group. Okay, so in this case, the biases are helping us understand something more about the environment. Okay. Any questions about that? Right, what's a hypercarnivore? Right, top predator just eat, 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 eats, eats meat. Um, yeah, so not doesn't eat vertical. Just eat, eat, yeah, you know, you eat, eat top of the food chain. Carnivore. Yeah. A wild dog. It's well. It's like a wild dog today, but not like a not like a feral dog today. So it's like a like an African, African, African right? Like an African wild dog. Probably not the same species. Probably related. I'm not sure. Yeah. So there's like you know roaming packs of feral dogs. It's not this. It's like a wild dogs, like African wild dogs, which are these really amazing um, animals that live in these tight social groups. So almost new research is showing they're almost too social. They have very good um, like they protect each other and built for reproduction, for lung reproduction. Very cool. Um, but they, they're very cooperative and have amazing hunting success, right? So a lion pride might succeed 20% of the time hunting, while dogs succeed like 80% of the time. They're pretty good carnivores. Um, so, Yeah, I don't think I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't think that every wild dog would be the top predator. That was like yeah, they were like, 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 like bigger than like the hyenas were. But I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So, what are other biases? So, definitely other biases we talked about today that can affect our data. Right, the scientists we want to get the truth. Right, so, it's going to figure out where the biases are. So, what else is there that could affect our data? Simple area, how so? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so biases will go after successful areas and staying in successful areas. Good. That happens both with getting fossils, it also happens in like research topics, right? So I want to get tenure. So I can go off on some crazy new research idea that might not pan out, but I can stay safe so I can know I can get papers in. Right? So I might stay safe and thus miss this and we're like, oh, looking at interaction between plants and fungi via a lot of nutrients. Yep. What else? Right, so it could be fossils, you know, in areas that are, you know, so I mean, humans have this bias towards living big cities next to the coastline and things like that. Maybe it's biased in that covers up certain areas that are related to fossils. Right, so you have fossils that aren't at the surface. Unless you're very, very lucky, you're not going to find them. So you know, so you're ways to get to those, that, those biases. Yeah. Good, what else? Well, science in general, we have the biology in general, what other biases might be playing a role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, as mentioned, like not being careful of certain like management and the small things. Actually, I think it was ten years ago, we found a whole class of organisms that live in the ocean, fecobacteria, that are a big component of the ocean, you know, food chain, but they're small and they're so small that through the filters we use. So you you know you get ocean water, filter to get this good stuff to look at, right? And these cool bacteria would go right through the filter, back in the ocean, and so you wouldn't see them. Right? It was until you know sequencing, like, oh, what's all this DNA coming from? Oh, they figure out like, oh, this this picobacteria are in a big role. But things like that can really matter too. Great. All right. I'll see you all on on Wednesday.